Chuck put his clubs in the back of my truck and said, Oh, I forgot my wallet, and then hurried back into the house. This gave me a chance. I opened the putter case, pulled out his putter, closed the case, and hid the putter behind the seat. He came out of the house with a wallet in his hand and said, I probably won't need this since I plan to beat you turkeys and you'll have to buy beer. In your dreams, I replied, pulling away and heading towards the Singing Hills Golf Club. I smiled internally, anticipating his face when he discovered his favorite putter was missing. He considered this putter his lucky putter ever since he beat Sam, Phil and me three out of every five times he bought it. Taking his putter wasn't about stopping him from beating us, it was all about keeping him off balance. I've been doing this quite a lot lately, and as I head towards the golf club, I'm remembering what I've done to it over the past few months. One night, I snuck over to his house after dark and loosened all the wheel nuts on his car. He couldn't figure out why his steering wheel was vibrating until the front right wheel broke a stud and fell off. All four wheel hubs were damaged and had to be replaced at a cost of $119.86 each. Also, three of his tires had abnormal wear and had to be replaced at a cost of $102.67 each. Two weeks later, I found a rusty piece of metal at a construction site and went to him again after dark and put the piece under his left rear tire. This damaged the tire so badly that it could not be repaired and he had to buy a new one. Then there was the night we met at the club for drinks. I had my usual two pints and was ready to leave, but he wanted to stay a little longer, so I left him there and walked to my truck. As I passed his car, I pulled out my keys and scratched his paint from the front to the rear bumper. I don't know how much it cost at the auto repair shop, but he was without a car for three days. When we got to the golf club, Sam and Phil were already there practicing putting on the green, and we had about ten minutes before our exit time, so Chuck and I joined them. What the hell? Chuck shouted as he reached into his bag for his putter. What's happened? I asked. My putter is gone. Great, Phil said. Maybe all your luck is gone too, and we're going to kick your ass today. There was some more talk about when he last saw it and whether he had taken it to be polished and left it in the garage. Sam got closer to the truth than he thought when he said, Maybe Rob paid someone to break into your garage and steal it. When it was time for us to leave, Chuck rushed to the pro shop and bought another putter. The one he bought was definitely not a happy one for him. He missed the first hole three times and the second and third four times. The day gave me another opportunity to laugh at him. On the sixteenth hole, he cut his putt into the trees on the edge of the fairway. We went looking for him, and I found him. I looked around, making sure no one was looking in my direction, and pressed the ball into the soft soil and covered it with a few leaves. A few minutes later, Chuck was forced to take a penalty and take another shot so as not to delay the next group. Sam, Phil and I beat Chuck badly that day, and he had to buy beer. I usually only drink two pints, but that day I drank five because it made Chuck reach into his wallet. As I drank the beer that Chuck paid for, I remembered another time I set him up. I was a member of Eagles Rest Country Club, and Chuck wanted to join. I made a big bet on his entry. The vote was held by secret ballot, and the vote had to be unanimous. When his application was reviewed, there was one no, and yes, it was me. As I drove him home, I thought about the best thing I had done to set him up. It was at a barbecue at his house about two months ago. I had been there for about an hour, sipping my first pint, when his wife Francine approached me. I've known Franny as long as I've known Chuck. She was a clumsy, thin, and inconspicuous girl. Her father got a promotion, and they moved out of town. They came back five years later, and the ugly duckling had turned into one hell of a sexy swan. I dated her a couple of times and tried to get her into bed, but it didn't work out. There was no spark between us, so we remained just friends. Franny was one of those sexy girls that guys look at and want to sleep with at least once to see if she is as good as she looks. Anyway, I always wanted to sleep with her at least once, and she knew it. I flirted with her even after she married Chuck, knowing it wouldn't lead anywhere, but damn, miracles do happen sometimes. I wasn't thinking about a novel, 
just one time to see if she is as hot as she looks. But let's get back to the barbecue. Franny came up to me and asked how I was doing. Fine. How's your love life? No way. Aw, oh, come on, Rob. A hot guy like you should just fight off girls. I'm saving myself for you, Franny. I just know you'll realize you don't want Chuck and you'll want me. You're such a talker. All you want to do is get into my pants and do what I wouldn't let you do when we were dating. And that makes me bad. At least you're honest, and that's more than I can say about some. As she spoke, she looked at Chuck, who was talking to Sylvia Martin, trying to look into her cleavage. The look on Franny's face showed me that all was not well in the Maxwell household. Look at this cow, she said. If she didn't have those 40 DDS, no guy would look twice at her. She turned to me and said, You know, right? I know that. That this idiot is cheating on me. I didn't answer, but the look on my face told her that I really knew about it. I thought you were my friend, Rob. Why didn't you tell me? and make you go through the same pain I did when I found out about Shelley. No way, Franny. I wouldn't do that to someone I didn't love, let alone someone I did. I forgot about Shelley. You were unbearable when she left. She looked at me for a few seconds and then said, You always wanted to sleep with me, didn't you? I was stunned by her words. I'd never heard Franny use bad words in all the time I'd known her, so getting laid was a huge surprise. And then this is what she said. It wasn't a question, but a statement. I quickly recovered and said, You know what I wanted, Franny? Would you do that, even knowing Chuck was your friend? Stupid question, Franny. I would do it right now in front of God, all your guests, and your husband. I don't think I can do it, but I'd really like to see Chuck's face if you did. Would you sleep with me even though you knew it was just revenge, and not because I find you sexually attractive. Franny, I can honestly say that I would do this even if I knew you'd just lay there chewing gum and staring out the window until I was done. Wow, Rob, I didn't know you were such a romantic. She looked at Chuck, and he was still ogling Sylvia's cleavage. I can't say I blame him. I've seen these things up close and personal, and Franny was absolutely wrong to think that no guy would pay attention to Sylvia if she didn't have huge breasts. Sylvia was damn hot in bed, at least before she married Max. I haven't heard of her cheating on him, so Chuck was probably just daydreaming. I felt someone push my arm and turned to see Franny staring at me. You too? Are you like Chuck and like to stare at huge breasts? Thinking quickly, I said, no, I was just trying to figure out what he sees in her. She has nothing but those huge breasts. Maybe it will happen in time, but the last time I saw them naked, they stood straight and proud. Go hang out, Franny said, and meet me at the downstairs bathroom in ten minutes. If the door is locked, knock three times quickly, and then she left. I decided to be sneaky and walked up to Chuck and Sylvia. I leaned over and kissed her on the cheek and said, How are you, dear? Ready to leave Max for me? She smiled and replied, Not now, honey. Give me a little more time. I'll give you as much time as you need if you promise me that my name will be at the top of the list when you decide to leave. I promise, honey. Hey, what about me? Chuck asked. Sorry, Charlie, but Franny will cut off my breasts if I do anything to you. She said this in such a tone that Chuck immediately realized that this would not work, and he turned and left. He's such a jerk, Sylvia said, always trying to peek into my cleavage, as if I'd ever do anything to him. Give him a chance, honey. He's a man, and you know that every man who sees you wants you. Anyway, this is his house, and his wife is here. He must be an asshole to act like that in front of her. I don't know, maybe you're right. I remember giving you lustful looks at parties at my house when Shelley was there. That's different. Shelley was a pig and deserved you to look at the other girls in front of her. You knew about her, right? Everyone knew about her, honey. Then why didn't anyone tell me? Because you're one damn good guy and no one wants to be the one to hurt you. 
You loved that stupid bitch so much that you wouldn't trust the messenger and just stop being friends with someone who opened your eyes. I hate to admit it, but it's probably true. Sylvia was silent for a moment and then said, Max and I don't get along right now. I have no proof, but I believe he is the male version of Shelley. She leaned over and kissed me on the cheek and said, Your name is at the top of the list, honey. When she left, I remembered my last time with her and hoped that she would get the proof she was looking for. I arrived at the downstairs bathroom at the appointed time. The door was locked, so I knocked three times and the door opened. Franny stepped back and let me in. She closed the door and locked it, then said, We don't have much time. This is just to prove to you that I'm serious. Get him out, please. We got busy quickly sex. Chuck leaves the day after tomorrow and will stay for two days. Do you think you can wait that long? I can if I have to, but I'm still willing to do it right now in front of Chuck. I thought you were his friend. There's friendship, Franny, and there's you, and I've wanted you since our first date. I've never cheated on Shelley, but if you had proposed to me while I was married to her, I wouldn't have hesitated to say yes. You know the right thing to say to a girl, but I'd rather not do it in front of Chuck. I plan on doing it more than once, and if he sees it, that'll be the end of it. He makes good money, and I like my lifestyle, and I don't want him to change, so I plan to horn him for years to come. For many years? Will I be just the first of many, or can I hope for exclusivity? I'll only do this with one at a time, Rob, and how long it lasts is up to you. Then you'll never do this to anyone else. She looked at me for a long time, then said, Then see you Tuesday evening. What time should I be at your place? I leave work at 5 and am usually home by 5.40. See you at 6, and then she unlocked the door and returned to her guests. On Tuesday, Franny rang my doorbell at 6 o'clock sharp. I opened the door and stepped back to let her in. She had been to my house many times, so she knew where everything was. Let's not waste time talking, she said, heading towards the bedroom. Yes, Franny was as hot as she looked, and once again I thought Chuck must be an idiot to waste his time on other women. Franny did everything. Before she left, she asked me for the key, and I gave it to her. When I came home from work on Wednesday, Franny was already there and had prepared dinner. Besides being fantastic in bed, Franny was an excellent cook. Chuck usually went on business trips once or twice a week, and for the next two months, whenever he went, Franny was at my house. She didn't have to worry about not being home when Chuck called since they didn't have a home phone. They didn't see the point of having a home phone since they never used it. They had cell phones, and that was all they thought they needed. Maybe three out of every five nights Franny was with me, Chuck called. What turned her on the most was taking his call when I was having sex with her. Yes, sex with Chuck's wife was the best thing I did to set him up, and I still saw her once or twice a week. Why did I set up the guy who was my best friend? Shelly came into my life slowly. My daily routine was to wake up at 3.45, put on my coffee, and check my email on the computer. Then I would open the National Weather Service website and look at the forecast for the day. Monday through Friday, I was at the gym doors when they opened at 5 a.m. and on Saturdays and Sundays at 7 a.m. One morning, while working out on a seated leg press machine, I noticed a woman enter the circuit training area and begin stretching. She was a damn attractive woman, very pleasant to look at, and almost exactly what I imagined an ideal woman would be. I loved watching her train. Anywhere else I would have made the move, but not in the gym. For many people, training has a mental component and it's their own time, so I didn't mean to intrude. I noticed the absence of a wedding or engagement ring, but that might not mean anything since many people take off their rings while working out. One Sunday, as I was sitting in the hot tub after working out, she walked in and headed to the steam room. Seeing me in the hot tub, she changed direction and walked over, getting into the water with me. She sat down on the other side of the bath and, making herself more comfortable, said, You're Rob, right? I nodded and she continued, I'm Shelly. Nice to meet you, Shelly. 
She sat silently for about 30 seconds, then said, I see the way you look at me when I work out. Guilty. Why? Why what? Why are you looking at me? Because I'm a man, and I'm naturally wired to admire beautiful women. Plus, you seem to be what I consider my ideal woman. And what, I pray you, makes you the ideal woman? Tall woman, and I'd put you at about 5'8". It's actually 5'9". What else? Long legs, but that usually goes with being tall. Then there's long hair. I've never seen your hair in anything other than a ponytail. But it must be long because even in a ponytail, it reaches the middle of your back. And you look beautiful without makeup. Is that all? Is this all you need to be your ideal woman? No, there's more. But I haven't seen you in situations that would allow me to check those boxes. Tell me what these items are, and I'll tell you if they can be checked off. Wears short skirts and dresses to show off her legs. Likes to wear high heels. Again to show off her legs. You can check both boxes. I don't own a single long skirt or dress, and I have at least a dozen pairs of heels, none of which are shorter than four inches. I have three pairs with five-inch heels and one pair with six-inch heels. What else? I like dancing. And I have that. Ballroom, salsa, and I'm really into country music. This is all. There are a couple more points, but I have to know you a lot better before I can mention them. Okay, when? When is that? When are we going on a date so you can get to know me enough to tell me the rest of the points? And so began my life with Shelley. When I arrived at her door for our first date, she greeted me in a minidress dress and five-inch heels. She had a great date. In addition to her stunning beauty, she was smart, witty, and had a great sense of humor. Shelley was a real gift. She didn't lie about her dancing skills. She could win dance competitions if she had a decent partner, which, by the way, I wasn't. I loved to dance and was quite good at it, but I was far from Shelley's level. When I brought her home, she said, I don't usually kiss on the first date, but sometimes a girl needs to make exceptions, and she gave me a hot, passionate kiss. Can we do this again? I asked. Call me, she said. Soon. As I walked to my car, I was already picking up the ring that I was going to give her when I proposed. After our fifth date, when I brought her home, I kissed her, and she pushed me away, saying, Enough of this stupid game. We both know what we really want. And she tugged at my tie, leading me into her apartment and then into her bedroom. I was lying on my back, looking at the ceiling and thinking about how I was so lucky to have found this woman, when she said, I think you know me well enough now to tell me what other items are on your ideal woman's list. You've already completed all the items. What are these points? Loving sex is one of them, and being good for pleasure is another. We got married six months later. The next five years were great. We suited each other. Everything we did together felt right, as if it was predetermined. We shared most of each other's interests, but not all. She didn't like bowling, but I did. I played in two men's track leagues, one on Tuesdays and the other on Thursdays. Shelley used these evenings for activities that were not interesting to me. She was an avid bridge player, and I couldn't stand the game, so she played on Tuesdays. Shelley was a great reader and always had a book with her. She had one in her car, one in her bag, and one at home. She didn't watch TV. I had several programs that I liked to watch, and she would sit next to me on the couch and read while I watched. On Thursdays while I was bowling, she attended book clubs at the library and always came home with a new book signed by the author who was the evening's featured guest and keynote speaker. Shelley was a great cook and fantastic in bed. Even after five years of marriage, we were still like horny teenagers. Five nights a week was common. We gave up going to the gym on Saturdays and Sundays because we preferred to lie in bed and enjoy morning sex. Life couldn't be better than waking up with Shelly. I didn't think my life could be more perfect. Everything fell apart three days after our fifth anniversary. I was scheduled to fly to Salt Lake City for a three-day training session with one of our clients and left for the airport straight from work. When I arrived at the airport, 
I was informed that the Salt Lake City Airport was closed due to weather conditions and I was put on the first flight the next morning. It didn't even occur to me to call Shelly. She told me in the morning when I was leaving for work that she wasn't going anywhere. As I turned onto our street, I saw Shelly getting into a car parked on the curb. I caught enough to notice that she was wearing a short skirt and heels. She sat down next to the driver, they kissed, and the car pulled away from the sidewalk. I kept a safe distance and followed them. They went to Duke's Steakhouse. When they got out of the car, I saw that the driver was her colleague, and if I remembered correctly, he was married. I sat outside and looked at his car, and an hour or so later they got out and drove to the grotto bar and dance hall. I didn't follow them inside because I didn't want them to notice me. I was a little in denial. It could have just been a platonic friendship. The kiss could have been friendly and her sexy outfit could have just been to make her feel good. As I remembered, his wife travels a lot for work, and it could have just been two friends supporting each other while their spouses were away. Whatever it was, I wanted to know more before jumping to conclusions. It was eleven when they went out and got into his car. Denial went into the trash when Shelley sat next to him as they drove out of the parking lot. Half a block later Shelley was out of sight, and I knew she was pleasuring him. God knows she did this to me often enough when I was driving. I followed them to the Motel 6 on Fairmont. Shelley reappeared as they pulled into the motel parking lot. Five minutes later, they were in room 106. I had seen enough. I drove across town and checked into a hotel for three days. The next morning, I called my boss and said that I would reschedule the training session due to a family emergency. I woke up at 6 in the morning, and at 7.30 I parked where I could see the parking lot and the main entrance to the building where Shelley worked. She arrived at 10 minutes to 8, which meant she either didn't spend the night at the motel or they were up early enough to give her a ride home to get the car. As soon as she entered the building, I left and two hours later I was at the Spencer Agency office. At two o'clock I met with the agency representative, and by four o'clock the house was equipped with audio and video recording equipment. At five o'clock I was again parked where I could overlook the Shelley building. She left at half past five and I followed her to the Starlight Motel on Hancock. She rented a room, and when she left the office, she picked up the phone and made a call heading to room 102. Twenty minutes later, a man I had never seen before knocked on the door of the room Shelley was in, and the door opened and he entered. Two hours later they were still there, so I drove back to my motel. I had dinner at the village inn across the street, and then returned to my room and immersed myself in Robert Parker's latest novel. The next day I didn't watch Shelley arrive at work. I went to our area, but not to the house, I parked a block away and called the number Spencer had given me, then entered a code that allowed me to listen to all phone calls that had taken place since the system was installed. There were several empty calls, and then, Hello? Hi, honey, it's me, Shelley said. Rob is away again, and I miss our bed alone so damn much. Do you think you can help me? At what time? I'll be home by six, so what do you say we do it at seven? Agreed. Just remember to park a block away and go through the back door. I don't want the neighbors to see anything they might tell Rob. I didn't recognize the voice, but at 6.30 I was parked a block away when a black Dodge Ram pulled up and parked. A guy I'd never seen before came out and walked down the driveway of the house where the Mackenses used to live. They moved and the house was empty and for sale. I couldn't see my back door from where I was sitting but I had no doubt that I had just seen Shelley's seven o'clock appointment. I went back to my room and spent some time wondering how long Shelley had been cheating on me. I usually did one business trip a month, sometimes two, and it's been that way since we got married. The next day I met with a lawyer and learned my options, and in the evening I came home when I usually returned from my trip. Shelley greeted me with a passionate kiss and said, Dinner is ready but wouldn't you rather work up an appetite first? We made love the night before I left, and she had sex every night while I was gone. I know I said that one of the things I wanted for an ideal woman was to love sex, but Shelley exceeded all expectations. However, I wasn't ready for confrontation, 
so I let her lead me to the bedroom, where I really worked up my appetite. Over dinner, I listened to her tell me how much she missed me when I was on business trips, and how much she wished I didn't have to travel anymore. Then I told her the news that I would have another three-day trip next week. She wasn't happy, but said I should be prepared to be exhausted when I left, and then spent the weekend trying to make sure I was really tired. I didn't watch the video with Shelly and the guy with the Dodge Ram because I really didn't want to see it yet. I decided to wait until I got back from my trip and watch it along with the rest of the footage the cameras had captured. On Monday morning, I kissed her goodbye and left for the team tuning. I had already agreed with the Spencer agency to monitor Shelley for the three days that I would be away and was interested in what they would collect for me. Everything turned out as I expected. She cheated every night while I was gone. The main surprise for me was that one of the two who had it was my best friend Chuck Maxwell, and he did it on Monday and Wednesday. Shelley was making out with Chuck on our bed, and the other guy was having his fun in room 230 of the Shangri-La Motel on Paris Street. I had audio and video of Chuck, and to be honest, I've seen better videos. I also had audio recordings of some of the phone conversations. One of the guys she slept with called her on Tuesday and said, Pete said your husband is away again. Do you think you can fit me in? You already know that I'm writing to you in. You've slept with me enough times. This told me that what Shelley was doing wasn't something she started very recently. I had audio of Shelley calling Chuck, and the conversation was almost identical to the one she had with the Dodge Ram guy. I left work early to watch CDs of what Shelley was up to. I really wasn't interested in watching Shelley's behavior. I was interested in the conversation in the bedroom. I was looking for some insight into why Shelley was doing this. All I saw left me confused. I expected to hear myself shot at and ridiculed, but it turned out to be the opposite. The first thing I looked at was the story of Shelley and the Dodge Ram guy, or Pete as I learned. One day he asked her why she didn't leave that idiot and marry him, and she replied, Because I love that little idiot and I don't love you. All you mean to me is great sex that gives me pleasure when he's not around. I was surprised again when Shelley and my good friend Chuck got together. I didn't understand this. Why did she protect me and at the same time stab me in the back? Armed with video footage of Chuck, Pete, and a third guy named Riley, as well as information I received from the lawyer I spoke with, I was sitting at the kitchen table with a piece of paper in front of me when Shelley returned home from the house. Job. Shelley came in, walked over, and kissed me on the cheek and then asked, what are you doing? Looking through my list of ideal women. For what? We have already established that I am your ideal woman. I always thought so, but it seems I was wrong. What do you mean you were wrong? Here, look at the list. See the unchecked box at the bottom of the list. She took the list from me, read it, and I saw her face lose color. The unchecked box was, must be true at all times. I don't understand. Of course, Shelley. I've been away from home for six nights in the last two weeks, and every night I've been gone, you've been unfaithful. Five different guys in six days. Faithful, can you? The fact that I had just told her that I knew about five should have told her that I had a cold, but she tried to stick it out. I don't know what you're talking about, Rob. Then you must have the memory of a mosquito. They only live 24 hours, so I guess you can't remember anything that happened before last night. I slid the CD over here and said, You can watch this, and it will help refresh your memory, but before you do that, I need to tell you something. I saw a lawyer and found out that this is a no-fault state, so everything we have will be divided equally. We make the same amount of money, so there won't be any child support, and of course, since we don't have kids, we don't have any savings. We used everything we had to get into this house, so as far as assets go, it's a house. We haven't been in the house long enough to accumulate much equity, and what little we have will be eaten up by selling costs and commissions. I will be the big loser because I will have to pay attorney fees and court costs. The big question is, do you want to be served at work or here at home? Served? I don't want a divorce. I love you, Rob, 
and you know that I do. You have a funny way of showing it, Shelley. How long have you been stabbing me in the back? She looked away and I said, It doesn't matter. I don't really need to know. The five I know about are five too many. Do you want to move or do you want me to do it? I don't want either of us to move, Rob. We belong to each other. Sorry, Shelley, but I can only live with my ideal woman, and that's not you. You need to let me talk, Rob. I need to explain what you think is wrong. No, I don't need to let you talk, Shelley. What's on this CD speaks for itself, and nothing you say can erase what I sat and watched. I stood up and Shelley said, Sit down, Rob. We can't discuss this unless you sit here and talk to me. Didn't you listen to what I just said? There is nothing you can say that will erase what I have heard, seen, and now know, and I cannot live with a man who could do that to me. We are Shelley. Take it. You ruined our marriage. Accept it and move on. I left and headed to the basement where we kept the suitcases. Within half an hour, I had gathered most of what I would need for the next two weeks and placed it by the front door. I needed to get some more stuff, but I had to rent a trailer because most of it was too big to fit in my car. Shelley watched me put the bags down and said, Please, Rob, just sit down and let me explain. You will see that it is not what you think. I ignored her and went to the downstairs bedroom I had turned into a home office and grabbed my laptop. Shelley kept following me and begging me to sit down and talk to her, but I didn't bother to answer. Opening the door to leave, I said, I'll be back Monday or Tuesday to pick up the rest of my things. Please, Rob, for the love of God, let me explain. Without saying a word, I carried my things to the car and drove away. I checked into a motel and spent Saturday and Sunday looking for an apartment. I found a nice store close to work that had everything I wanted. Pool, gym, and laundry. I chose two bedrooms because I wanted to turn one into a home office. I wrote a check for the deposit and the first and last month's rent. I won't be able to move here until they check my credit, but there won't be any problems here. Shelley and I had different credit cards, so I didn't have to call to cancel either one, and the check cleared because I followed the lawyer's advice and took out half of what we had in the bank and opened new accounts only in your name. I informed Sheila, our secretary, of my status regarding Shelley and asked her not to forward calls from Shelley to me. Just tell her I'm out of the office or in a meeting or something. Why don't I just tell her not to call because you told me not to answer her calls? This suits me. She smiled and said, When you start making your list of girls you'd like to date after your divorce is final, would you mind putting my name near the top? How about a list of girls I want to date once we're legally separated? What is legally separated? Once it's filed today or tomorrow, I'll consider myself a free agent. Maybe for you, but not for me. I will not date a married man, and that will be you until your divorce is final. I thought it was a refreshing attitude. I could handle dating a girl who has ethics. How about lunch so we can get to know each other a little better? This way we will have some idea if we want to move forward when the divorce is final. I'd like that. I took Tuesday afternoon off, rented a trailer, and called around until I found two free friends who could help me move heavy stuff like toolboxes and an air compressor. As I approached the house, I found a note on the door. Rob, I changed the locks. I'll give you the key to the new ones when you sit down and talk to me. I love you, Shelley. Stupid bitch, I thought as I walked through the back of the house. I broke out the basement window, walked through the house, unlocked the doors, and then Mike, Sal, and I carried out what I wanted and loaded it into the trailer. I left the front door wide open as we headed to the storage unit I had rented. After unloading the trailer, we took it back to the rental place and then went to Danny's bar and grill for some beer. We had been there for about two hours when Mike, looking past me, said, Oh, oh, incoming. I looked over my shoulder and saw Shelley walking towards us. I turned to Mike and Sal and told them they might want to find a table. This could get ugly. Sal said, This is Roger, and the two of them stood up and went to find a booth or table. 
Shelley walked over, sat down on the stool that Mike had just vacated, and said, I thought I'd find you here. I just looked at her and took another sip of beer. Did you have to break the window? Yes. We need to come in. All you had to do was give me fifteen minutes and listen to what I had to say, and you could have the key. It's better to break a window than listen to you. She looked at me for a few moments and then said, You took the computer. To her. I had things there that I needed. I'll look through it, pull your stuff out of it, and send it to you. Why are you so hard on this Rob? Why can't you let me explain that it's not what you think? Why can't you understand that the problem here is not what I think? The problem is what I know, not what I think. I know you've been completely unfaithful to me, and while I don't know exactly how long you've been doing this, I know it's been at least a year. Then I had a thought. What was done was done, and although my temperament did not usually lean towards such things as revenge, I did not think of pursuing the men Shelley had. True, they knew she was married, but I couldn't blame any man for wanting Shelley, and couldn't blame a man for taking her if she had said, come and get it, and that's exactly what she did. But Chuck wasn't just any guy. Oh no, Chuck was my best friend, and best friends shouldn't touch your wife, so Chuck had to pay. To get him to pay the way I wanted, I had to make sure he didn't know I was coming for him. Okay, I said. I will listen to what you have to say, but there is one condition. If I listen to you, then you have to promise that you won't tell Chuck Maxwell what I know about you too. Why? Because he was supposed to be my friend, and friends don't sleep with their friends' wives. He must pay, and for this I need him not to wait for me. Why? It's not his fault. It was I who pestered him. All he did was seize the opportunity. For me, it doesn't work like that. Being my friend, he should have said no. Being my best friend, he should have told me that you were hitting on him, and he didn't, did he? This is unreal, Ro. This is my condition for me to listen to you. Yes or no, I don't want to hear how you tried to be owned. I'm not interested in how you feel, you want to tell me, but I don't want to hear the details. Yes, Rob. So Chuck will never find out, right? Okay, Rob. He will never know. Okay, now speak. You know I love sex, and God knows I give you all you can handle, and you never gave up on me when I wanted it, which was often. You probably never realized that I wanted him all the time. When you started traveling for work, I became so excited that I climbed the wall. While your trips were only two or three days, I could hold on and wait for you. But then you went to Akron for five days and six nights, and I was going crazy sitting in the apartment with nothing to do. So one night, I went out for drinks with the girls from work. I wasn't planning on cheating, but after a few drinks and flirting, I ended up in a motel room. The next night, I told myself that since I had already done it, why not do it again, and I called the guy again. We've done it again. I felt guilty when you came back, but nothing changed. I still loved you madly, and it didn't seem harmful to us. Your next trips were for two and three days, and I could hold on. Then you left for four days, and on the third evening I ended up in a man's apartment. Again, it didn't hurt us. The next time you left, I decided that if it didn't harm us, why resist while you were gone, and I started doing this every night when you were gone. Do you understand, Rob? I didn't do it because I didn't love you. I didn't do it because you weren't man enough for me. I was just getting the sex I needed when you weren't there to take care of me. A trip to Akron? Oh my God, Shelly, that was over four years ago. Exactly, Rob. Four years, and we were happy and loved each other all this time. What I did while you were away didn't hurt us. I'm still madly in love with you, and you know it. So you only did this when I wasn't there, and you really needed sex. That's right, Rob. If it upsets you that much, I'll stop. But we don't need to be apart, Rob. I love you, darling, and you know it. This is all? Is that all you wanted to tell me? This is all? Yes, dear. Will you come home now? No. In addition to being a cheater, you are also a liar. You said you only did it when I wasn't there and you needed relief. Nonsense. 
I know all about the missed book club meetings and bridge games you skipped to have sex with your boyfriends even when I was home. I know all about the times you slept with them while I was in town, but on the golf course. You cheated on me with God knows how many men, and that makes you a creature in my eyes, and I can't live with someone like that. Plus, you put me in a situation where I think every friend I have had you is like my friend Chuck. Do you understand what it's like for me to see a friend, and the first thing I think is, did you touch my wife? No, Shelley, you destroyed our marriage, and I'm not coming home. Don't forget your promise, and I got up and left. Whether she will keep her promise not to tell Chuck, only time will tell. To be honest, she wasn't very good with promises. Apparently, she didn't keep the ones she gave at our wedding. I spared her the humiliation of being called to work. She was called when she was leaving home for work. I copied all her data from the computer to a flash drive and mailed it and received an email asking how I could leave knowing that she loved me. I sent her a photo I took of the video with Pete. I attached a note that read, That's why? She seemed to finally understand because she stopped trying to contact me. The divorce was finalized within six months, and I kept my promise to Sheila. The day my divorce was final, I told her I was officially single and asked her out, and she said yes. We ate lunch together a couple times a week and talked, so we knew quite a bit about each other without that first date awkwardness. When I drove her home after our 3D date, she kissed me goodnight, and it was a hot kiss. I tread carefully with Sheila because of our working relationship. A wrong move on my part could make the work environment tense. She must have thought that my caution meant shyness and took the lead. When I drove her home after our fourth date, she kissed me and then asked, Do you want to see me naked? After six months, I thought we were on to something good and started to think maybe we should make it permanent. Sheila put an end to these thoughts the night I proposed. I like you, Rob. I really like you, but I don't love you. I can't marry a man I don't love, even if I like him very much and is a great lover. Can we just remain friends with benefits? I agreed, but it was no longer the same, and although we remained friends, the privileges gradually began to disappear. Sheila understood this. One day she asked me why we started seeing each other less often, and I told her the truth. I loved being married, and I want to get married again. You made it clear that it won't be you. I need to start looking for a permanent partner, and that means spending less time with you. I searched and dated, but could not find anyone other than Sheila with whom I would like to start a family. I didn't miss the sexual part of marriage because I had enough of it. I saw Franny once or twice a week and Sheila once or twice a week, and I had another partner who would fill all the other nights if I allowed it. It was Tuesday evening, and I had been home for about twenty minutes when the doorbell rang. When I opened the door, Shelley was standing there. Before I could ask what she wanted, she said, Do you know what day it is, Rob? Tuesday. Today is our anniversary, Rob, and we always celebrated it by trying to recreate the first night of our honeymoon. I stood there and remembered that night. Come on, Rob, what do you have to lose? You know that I am the best lover you have ever had. Let's take a walk down memory lane. She was right. She was the best lover I ever had, and honestly, I still loved that bitch and missed her. But, and it was a big, but I couldn't live with who she had become. However, she was the best. Without obligations. Without obligations. I stepped aside and let her in. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one.